And right around that time, I was still kind of, I had the GT750, I could ride that around a little bit. Um, and I had, I guess I didn't really have a whole lot as far as street bikes are concerned, but I had the KZ1000 and that kind of gave me a, you know, a taste for the big, you know, larger size uh, Kawasaki four stroke, you know, inline four motors. And, um, and so the, at the time, the fastest bike on the road was the Ninja ZX11 the 1100 cc ninja and uh so i was kind of like keeping my eyes open for one of them one came up in the newspaper and i thought hmm and i went to go see the thing and there was some custom work done had some motor work done to it he had a uh bigger sprocket on the front no no smaller sprocket excuse me smaller sprocket on the front uh which you know quicker acceleration that way um and Muzzy exhaust, complete muzzy exhaust, stage three jet kit. Um, I think it was either bored or stroked out a little bit in the motor. And he had the, the rims uh, powder coated like a, a kind of a fluorescent pinkish purple collar, which wasn't overly nuts about that, but I thought, oh, okay. And um, real big black guy, real big bodybuilder. And uh, he let me take it out. And I just, you know, drove it up the street, came back, and I said, yeah, it's really nice. And he said, do you want the bike? And I said, yeah, I'd like to buy it. And he said, it's yours. And I said, okay. And he said, you know why I'm going to sell it to you? He said, there's a lot of people that want this bike. He said, it's a real good price. And it was a very good price. He said, there's a lot of people that want the bike. But he said, you're the first guy that didn't beat this bike. And I said, well, it's not my bike. I'm not going to beat it. You know, I'm not going to ride it hard or anything. It's not mine. And he said, bike's yours if you want it. He said, I got a lot of other people lined up before you. But he said, you want this motorcycle, it's yours. So it's like, well, okay, <laughs> I'll take it. So here's a picture of my ZX11. It was a 1992. And there it is back there. There's the two frames yet. And there it is. And uh, it had a, he actually put an alarm on it, which is kind of interesting. But uh, a little tank. Um, cover thing there, tank bra or whatever I think they called them things. And there I am, back in the old days, before my beard. <laughs> but uh, there's my, that's the ZX-11. Some pictures of it, again working on it, taking things apart, you know, and making sure everything's functioning correctly and whatever else. There's the muzzy exhaust down there. Here I am over at my um, older sister and her husband's place, my brother-in-law. Took the bike over and showed it to them. And uh, there we go. Another picture at my childhood home. And a couple more pictures here. And the ZX-11. So I had it at the same time that I had the GT750. There we go again. That was my younger sister's car there. It wasn't one of mine, but there it is again. And uh, definitely have some stories on that bike. That was a really good machine. And uh, took it on a lot of different rides and trips and things like that. And just really, really fast. I mean, now it's like they got all these new bikes out the... The Hayabusa came out shortly after I had sold my uh, um, Ninja there, my ZX-11. But at the time, you know, if you know anything about the late 80s, early 1990s, the ZX-11 was pretty much the fast bike. I mean, Honda came out with the uh, CBR 1100XX or something, the, the, what was it, the Blackbird or something like that, whatever. And, um, you know, ZX-11s just were, you know, the fastest bikes. And that one was definitely one of the fastest bikes in the area. I raced a lot of different people on that thing, cars and motorcycles included. And, and um, it just, I had this thing that I would usually go at least 120 miles an hour whenever I took it out. And, uh, you know, I just was always trying to push the envelope a little bit further each time I took the thing out. And I remember the one time there was a, um, a, area in Strasburg where the speed limit was 25 miles an hour and I actually did 120 miles an hour over the posted speed limit so 
145 in a 25 zone. Didn't have many brains back then. And uh, I'm going to show a little bit of uh, some like Google map thing here of the area where I actually did a 175 miles an hour on that bike. Um, down, going down 372 I think it is. You go down this hill and then you go out onto the Normanwood Bridge which is about a mile long if I remember correctly and it's just straight as an arrow and uh, I mean and you can really go and fast and there's you know nobody going to pull out in front of you or anything else and I remember um, that was right around the time my brother-in-law uh, he was behind me on his motorcycle and I'm riding my my ninja and I just you know just really gunned it and got down on, you know, laid down you know, as much as I could on the tank to try to get my head below the, the windshield. And I'm just, you know, really went and basically I ran out of road, um, you know, as far as I think it would have gone faster, maybe up to 200 miles an hour. But I, you know, it was getting across there. I mean, when you, it's kind of weird because a lot of the rocket bikes, you get them up to 150 miles an hour, they'll get there like that. But then when you start to go over 150 miles an hour, all the friction and the wind and everything else it it's like it takes you you can get up to 150 like that and then it takes a lot longer to get to like higher speed and i got up to 175 miles an hour and i could see the bridge end of the bridge was coming up so i started trying to slow down and it was just like oh okay <laughs> it's like really the the forces and everything that they're on you at that speed it's pretty incredible and uh so that was definitely an interesting experience and um, but I had that thing for a while, and uh, ended up selling it then, because I was in that phase of just buying and selling things. But another time I was I was up in uh, northern Pennsylvania, and uh, riding with my brother-in-law and a friend of his. A friend of his was actually a police officer. It's kind of funny. He had a Ninja 750 R, and he was the lead bike. And then my brother-in-law he had a Ninja might have been his Ninja 900 at that point, and then me on my ZX-11. And we're cruising along. We're going, like, just ridiculous fast up. You know, we're doing, like, 120, 100, 120 or so, usually on average, going up the highway. And, um, you know, being led by a police officer, off-duty police officer, is kind of funny. But we're going up through the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon area, which is a lot of twisty, windy roads. And so this the guy up front, his name was Wendell, and he goes into the corner and he goes mm, and he's going around through the corner and I and I could just barely see when he was getting around the corner I could see his brake light come on and I thought okay and and my brother-in-law he's coming into the corner next and I see and he I got a little bit closer you know with him and I see he hit his brakes and he kind of swerved erratically into the other lane and so thankfully I slowed down a little bit I come into the corner and there's this big porcupine on the road I was like whoa okay into the other lane quick and uh but just you know riding just ridiculous stupid times back in those years and uh you know i'll say this uh it was by the grace of god that i even survived in those years all those years my my late teens and up through my 20s uh i certainly rode in a way that i really i truly had no fear and um it's not good the bible says the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom so I had a lot of things to learn. So uh, we're going to be getting into some of that more later. But uh, this is kind of a funny picture. Uh, another one of the vehicles I had back in those years. I had my ZX-11. And then I bought this Corvette. It was a 1982 Corvette. And I had this 1984, I think it was, Mercury Lynx four-cylinder. <laughs> so uh, this was I would drive this to work a lot of times when I didn't feel like taking the Corvette or my Ninja. But those were my three, you know, well, these were my two speed vehicles back then. I was, you know, had, I think, my three-wheeler back then, my Honda 200M. And it was, you know, off and on with different bikes and stuff. But that was my main speed bike, my fast car, and my economy vehicle. And uh, there's another picture of the three together. And uh, it's kind of funny because there were times, I mean, the uh, my Mercury Lynx, the thing leaked oil like pretty bad and and uh, it was just it was a dog I mean the thing did not go fast at all and I remember there were diff different times I'd, I'd go to leave for work in the morning I'd start work at six o'clock in the morning and uh, worked six to four and uh, 
and I remember I'd leave like you know 5 30 or so in the morning and sometimes I'd sleep in a little bit and I'd be like oh take the Ninja and I'll get there quicker you know or the Corvette or whatever else and uh, I remember sometimes I'd wake up and I'd be like okay you know I'm just kind of like getting up and things I'd get in go out and I'd be like I'll take the Mercury Lynx and I'd take off down the road and I remember there was a couple times I'm driving I'm like man something's wrong with the car it's just like it's not running right or something it's going slow <laughs> and I'm like oh wait yeah I'm in the Mercury Lynx not driving a Corvette so or my Ninja but uh, the Corvette I'll show you a couple pictures of this thing uh, again I was always trying to be practical and I went to a dealership that my dad knew and um, looking for a you know like a Jeep or something like that or whatever else and there's this Corvette sitting there that's after I washed it you can see the, the beads of water on the thing and um, I remember there's this Corvette sitting there and I'm looking at the different vehicles you know trying to be practical and there's this the really neat body lines of those Corvettes of that year and uh, I'm like how much is that Corvette over there <laughs> you know and uh, can I test drive that so I test drove it I bought the Corvette for five thousand uh, dollars which you know, it was actually a little bit less than some of the other vehicles I was looking at at the time. It was my parents' car right there, but then that was my Corvette. And uh, so, a lot of fun. I had it was the uh, it was the year of the Corvette that was not the the real good year. That was one of the years that they actually tried to be somewhat economical. Um, the speedometer only went up to 85 miles an hour on that year Corvette. They actually stopped. They didn't make a Corvette in 1983. And uh, another picture there, and um, of the three kind of from behind there, there's the Ninja. But uh, it was they had three different models of V8s in that year, 1982. They had a, and I don't remember that you know LS one or whatever else, but they had a 305 V8 that year, pretty bad. Then they had a 350 with like 200 horsepower, and then they had the 350 uh, V8 small block V8 that had, you know, 300 or so horsepower. Well, I had the middle one. It was actually like 185 horsepower or something like that. So it wasn't real, real, real fast, but it was still, it was a cool car. I had fun with it. I took it to a Corvette show up in Carlisle the one time and, and just, you know, cruising around with it and everything. But uh, I noticed that people treated me differently when I was in that Corvette. You know, I'm a young guy and I'm driving this Corvette around and people like, oh, a rich kid or something. I remember this one time this guy, he got this brand new truck and he pulls up beside me. He's like, oh man, is that your car? And I was like, yeah, it's my, it's my car. And he's like, oh wow, you know, that's, that's a cool car, man. It's, it's a sweet Corvette you got there and everything. And he's like, man, it must be nice to have one of those. And I'm like looking at his new truck and I said, what'd you pay for your truck? And he's like, Oh, no, like you know, twenty four thousand. And I'm like, I paid five thousand bucks for this Corvette. I'm like, you could add like f almost five of these things for what you paid for your truck. No, what do you mean? It must be nice to have a Corvette. So, but I lost one of the spinners the one time on one of the wheels, a little you know, in the center of the wheel. I lost one of the spinners, and, and I found out how expensive replacement Corvette parts are. So had that thing for a while, and again, got rid of it. Around that time. I decided I would buy a brand new Banshee. So here I am with my current jersey on, the AXO jersey. And there's my brand new uh, 1997 Yamaha Banshee. So that was three years after my high school graduation. And um, it was all stock. There I am jumping it. Had a little, a few small jumps around the property. Nothing real huge or anything else. Again, some jumping. There it is. And there's the Banshee. All stock at that point in time. There I have it in there. That was again in, during the time I had my fat cat there. The Banshee. No more riding shots. Some jumping. There you go. There's the infamous dual exhaust in the back. And uh, 
one of the tell telltale marks of a banshee owner. Let's show you a couple other pictures here quickly. One of the telltale marks of a banshee owner is there's no reverse on these things. So you get in a spot that you need to back up. Well, here's your backup right there. Hop off, go around, grab onto the grab bar and pull it backwards. And of course, what happens when you do, you're pulling like this and a lot of times you're kind of backing it up and things. And the exhaust pipes, being a two-stroke, it's they run, you know, fairly dirty and things, but you get the two exhaust rings on your pant legs. So if you're loading it onto the truck and you forget yourself and you lean in like this, you know, and you it gets you know, the two black rings on your pant legs. I used to always have people joke me about that. So I had that thing and I had it for a little while and again, you know, I was just buying and selling vehicles and uh, you know, pursuing some kind of happiness, some kind of purpose in life. And at that time it was just vehicles, just one thrill after the next and adrenaline rush, adrenaline rush, adrenaline rush. And uh and I sold the thing and or so I thought to some guys down in Philadelphia and I went down there and they had a cashier's check and oh you know we can't we can't come up and get it you know could you bring it down yeah sure you know we'll give you some extra money for gas yeah okay so I went down with my brother-in-law and my father the three of us went down and I'm thankful that they were with me um, some guys down there gave us this cashier's check and we helped them load the banshee into their truck or whatever and all oh, thanks, you know, okay, we, we went away. Turned out the cashier's check was completely forgery. And it fooled even my bank. You know, went in there, sold it for $4,500. And they said, uh, this cashier's check is only good for $450, up to $500. So they said, this thing's a forgery. And it had fooled, you know, the, it went back to the original company, I'm saying. It had fooled my local bank, went back to the original company, and they said, no, this is only good for $500. You were ripped off. You were taken. So, called the police up down in Philadelphia and explained the thing. And the guy was just like, "Do you have insurance?" And I did at that point in time. You know, and uh, you have insurance? Yeah. And he's like, "Okay, do that." I'm like, you're not going to investigate it? He was like, "No, nope." <laughs> A lot of the inner city, you know, type of stuff. That's what they do. They understand that the police aren't going to go after them for a petty theft or whatever. Disgusting. So that was the second four-wheeler that I had lost due to stealing. The first one was not, I was not trying to sell it or anything at that point in time. Uh, the second one, I thought I had actually sold it, but weird situation. But uh, around that time, my friend that I was hanging out with a lot, uh, Keith Ekman, the one that I've mentioned in different studies or different uh, things throughout this video, um, he... Uh, was living uh, Greenfield, Pennsylvania at the time, and there was an old Ford truck in his area there. And um, and he was like, hey, you know, you ought to check this thing out. It's, it's kind of a cool one. You know, it's an older one and stuff. So I went and, and said, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll look at it. So we drove over there the one time, and it was a 1969 Ford F100 Ranger. Watch, I'll show you the pictures here in just a minute. And um, so... Yeah, it looks, you know, pretty nice and everything. And um, so talking to the guy that owned it and everything else and and, and uh, had a 390 big block in it. And uh, and so he, he was joking around with me and he's like, you know, saw it and he's like, hey, you like older trucks? You know, we were talking and he said, I bet you if you drive this thing, you're going to buy it. Kind of like that they said to me at B&B Yamaha with the Quad Racer 500. And I was like, yeah, I don't know. Drove it and it just it had such an awesome sound to it and I was like, yeah, I'm gonna buy it. So again, another vehicle purchase. And there it is, my '69 Ranger with the 1997 Yamaha Banshee in the back. Just a couple pictures of it here to go through. Automatic transmission. I put the uh, cover on the back there, the Tanu cover. I put the um, aftermarket uh, wheels on it and then the mirrors I'll show you the original look here in just a couple minutes there's the emblem on the front it's actually a fairly rare truck the F100 Rangers there weren't that many just to show how big the motor was um, definitely a cool truck 
another picture of it. There's my, actually, my friend Keith Ekman's, uh, he had a 1952 Dodge in the background there that uh, we were going to fix up. Another picture of the motor, 390 big block. A picture of the interior there. That was the horn on those older uh, vehicles. And you can see the speedometer here. That'll be important later. You can see it goes to 85. You know, the, it goes like this over. It's not like a round speedometer. Um, there again. There it is down at the Susquehanna River. The original paint collar. There I was crossing a Peckway Creek campground. They had a Ford. I know it's a Ford truck, but you know, there's a Ford across there. You could drive across. Here's the original look of it when I first bought it. The old man looking truck, you know, with the white wall tires and the old hubcaps. There we go. Definitely a cool sounding truck though. Another picture of it. And another picture of it. And a uh, couple stories from that thing. Uh, one of which was one of my most memorable experiences. I was coming home the one day from work and uh, working at the boat place, building boats. And uh, my brother-in-law, I saw him and he was heading to my parents' place and he had his Ninja 900. And uh, so he's cruising along on his Ninja and we get down. There was a little bit of a straightaway on, I think it was 896, uh, heading towards Peach Lane. And so he's cruising along and there was like four cars in front of him. So... You know, he gets to this straightaway and there's nobody coming, so he goes taking off out around all these people. And I'm behind him in my old 69 Ford. And so he takes off, you know, on his Ninja. And I took off and I, I actually kept up with him. I mean, just pedal to the metal, I'm going. And the speedometer, you know, it's this long thing. It goes like this, you know. It goes over to 85 and it's going tick, 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 like this. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm going over 85. I don't know. So we get back to my parents place pull in and he goes man he goes i can't believe you stayed with me he's like do you realize how fast you were going no he said you were doing 120 miles an hour in that truck so pretty amazing i didn't think that the thing could do that kind of speed but neat old truck uh, definitely a cool thing i had that for a while and then i ended up selling that and again it's trading off with all these different vehicles part of the reason i sold it is because it was not four-wheel drive so looking around for, I always wanted a Jeep and, uh, you know, like a CJ7 or a CJ5 back in those years, 1970s, and early 1980s. And I uh, went to a dealership and I said, do you have any Jeeps? And the guy's like, oh yeah, we got one over here. I looked over and I'm like, huh, not familiar with that model, but I decided to take it for a test drive and I really liked it. Ended up buying the thing. It was a 1978 Jeep Wagoneer. Right there, you can see it. There's my old Ford. There's our old shed when I was starting to build on. This became my wood shop. Uh, again, part of my working testimony there. <clears throat> Here it is, back in the woods when it was snowing. And um, just ultra reliable. The thing just ran perfectly. Uh, <clears throat> I remember when I got it, the uh, the windows, a lot of them, the seal was shot, and the the oh, moon roof or whatever up there was the seal was shot. So I just took some black caulk and I caulked the windows around where the seal was, and I caulked the thing. It was not the nicest old uh, Wagoneer. And the back the rear quarter panel it was rusted out on the inside, so I put expandable foam in there, and you know I limped the thing along basically. The passenger side down on the floor. Uh, there was a hole, a big old rust hole, and uh, it was covered up with the carpet, and you know, eh, you know, whatever. And it was fine unless it was raining out. Then the carpet would start getting wet there, and it was always like, hey, "Don't put your foot there, you know. It's, don't put your foot too hard on that spot, you know. Go down through to the highway." I mean, looking back at the stuff I used to drive and stuff I used to do is just crazy, and how God had mercy on me that whole time to keep me alive through all that stuff. Uh, God is just so good to me, but more on that later. 
But that thing too, the, the frame was rusted pretty badly. And I remember if you would pull on an incline, it would actually, I don't know if the frame would bend a little bit or what, but you couldn't get the rear doors open on that thing. <laughs> it had to sit on a flat level area to get the back doors open. And uh, the side door, you can't see it from the photos, but the side door was gray. The rest of it was dark green. The hood, I think, was pretty badly faded too, but uh, the side door was gray. It was from another old Wagoneer, and it didn't shut quite right unless I mean, you really had to slam the thing and stuff. So I had driven it up to my buddy's cabin with my friend, and uh, we're coming back, and I dropped him off and everything, and, and uh, ran just perfect. I mean, the thing shifted. You could barely even hear it shift. It was just, transmission was so tight in that thing, and just a real good old vehicle. It was just a rust problem. So anyways, I drop him off, and he, you know, shut the door, but not hard enough. So I'm take off, I'm cruising down the road, and the door just goes whoop and flies open and slams somebody's mailbox, and, and their mail just went shooting all over the road. So I kept driving and, you know, and eventually shut the door. <laughs> it was bad. It was uh, quite an adventure. But uh, another time the brakes went out on that thing, so I limped at home and things and uh, had been driving up through the power line up in the mountains and, and uh, drove up through, I remember it was six inches of snow, not plowed or anything, steep, steep hill. And that stupid thing, it had the quadra track, you know, so it was like all time, you know, all wheel drive, like full time four wheel drive is what I was going to say. And um, the old Jeep quadra track, and uh, that thing just crawled right up that steep power line through unplowed snow. Incredible. It was a, just a really neat vehicle, and uh, sold it to a family, and I heard that they had the thing for like a long time and it just kept on running and you know they just kind of patch it up and the old Wagoneers were pretty neat and then I ended up having another 1986 years after that I don't have any photos of it but uh, I like old Wagoneers but they're hard to find in good condition more on that later so on to the next vehicle and I decided I'd go kind of practical for a little while so I bought this old uh, 1985 I think it was Chevy S10 pickup truck Total bare bones. It was an old owned by an old pig farmer. It was a four speed. I mean, no options at all. It had a it had an AM only radio in it, um, heat and defog, and that was it. And uh, I mean, just the absolute most basic truck. 2.5 liter four cylinder. I built this little canoe rack here in the back for my canoe I had at the time. Um, there's that. There's another picture of it from behind. another picture of it and uh, again you know it was like this weird time of like going between really wild vehicles fast vehicles and then very practical vehicles and it was just I was all over the place had that for a while and I started getting into logging right around that time period and uh, needed a more heavy-duty truck so I got this thing, it's a Chevy pickup truck, a 3500, in other words, a one ton truck. Had a uh, 454 big block in it, and uh, it was formerly a Pen Dot, a road crew truck, and then it was used by a nursery for a while, and then uh, I bought it after that. And uh, pretty good truck, uh, pretty, pretty good power with that thing, and um, but just was absolutely terrible on gas so um, had that thing right around the time I got saved and so I was doing some tree work for people and that's when I had my big chainsaw the 394 XP so that was kind of early when I first uh, got into this whole you know ministry thing um, but had that for a little while and sold it I remember I sold it to a Mennonite guy in the area and uh, we're sitting we're standing there talking about price and, and he said he said, it's kind of an interesting situation. He said, uh, you're praying to get a good deal, and I'm praying, you know, you're praying to get a, a good price, and I'm praying to get a good deal. <laughs> He's like, which prayer is God going to answer? And I was like, that's a good point. So, uh, but now I'm going to transition over to uh, digital pictures, and so I'll be putting these up on screen. So, I'll be back in just a couple minutes. 
All right, now we're gonna get into the uh, kind of the digital era, going from the old print uh, photos and stuff like that. And um, <clears throat> what happened is, right around the time I was had the I was in logging, um, shortly thereafter is when I got saved, when the Lord saved me, um, understood really what Christianity was all about and what it meant to be born again, and I was looking for something in my life that had meaning, and I found it a personal relationship with Jesus Christ outside of church buildings and going to church and being all the nice stuff that most people think religion is all about. And I'll talk more about that um, a little bit later. But And I also talked about that in the other parts of my testimony. So you can watch those parts if you're curious as to what I mean by that. But I'd gone for a long time after my salvation. I went for a pretty long time with uh, just, I had a the Chevy, the black Chevy, and then I bought a 1994 Ford Ranger, just basic truck. I wanted to, you know, four-wheel drive instead of the two-wheel drive uh, black Chevy that I had. And so for a long time, I didn't have anything. Um, we had a, uh, a uh, Yamaha Grizzly 600 uh, that we used to plow the lane, and I'd do firewood and hauling firewood around with that. But I don't really have any pictures. That was actually my dad's four-wheeler, so that was about the only thing you know, vehicle wise, you know, motorcycle ATV wise that I had. And so I was starting to think, you know, I mean, I, I went through the time of studying the Bible and everything else. And I kind of was just like eh, with motorcycles and, but I kind of missed it. And I thought, you know, is it a sin for a Christian to have a motorcycle? Is this some kind of thing that's wrong? And it was like, no, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Talk about, about that later. I'm going to show you some scriptures on that. And uh, so I was kind of talking it over with some of my buddies, you know, saved, you know, brethren and things. And, and uh, the one said, hey, he said he was a delivery truck driver. He's like, hey, I saw a, a Suzuki DR650 dual sport, you know. I saw one of these things down in New Holland area. And uh, you ought to go check it out. You know, I can give you the phone number and stuff for the guy. And I was like, yeah, I'll go check it out. So uh, I, th I forget if I went just went down to check it out or actually drove down and saw it there. But uh, checked it out, and uh, it had been sitting for a while. The guy was from Colorado, um, and the bike was originally a California bike. And then he bought it from a guy in California living in Colorado, and then he brought it to Pennsylvania when he moved to Pennsylvania. And he had it for a little while. I guess he had just kind of put it in storage when he moved. And he bought a Harley Davidson when he got here to Pennsylvania. So he had this DR650, and he was like, yeah, I just got to get rid of it. And everything so um, it had been wrecked bought a lot of wrecked things and uh, laid it over you know and it was all scraped up the plastics were scraped up you know above the headlight and and he said it wasn't running very good either so okay you know so I went and I rode it and everything and I thought oh this thing's pretty nice you know it's got some you know it's banged up a little bit scraped up a little bit and not running real great but I thought yes yeah, not too bad I mean if you have a bike it's not running good it's gonna be either you know, if it starts, well, it's probably not the spark plug. Could be if it's kind of fouled, you know, you're going to get, it's going to run a little bit choppy and whatever. But usually, you know, if it starts, it's not the plug. It's usually either going to be your carburetor or, you know, the air filler is clogged or something like this. So I thought, well, it's not going to be that big of a deal. If it's been sitting for a while, usually that's the carburetor. It's got some dirt down in the bowl of the carburetor. Um, something, you know, the main jet's clogged or whatever. So... Cool. So I bought it, and um, at the time, I didn't. I I'd, I'd always in, see. I should explain something. In the past, when you, um, you know, with motorcycles in Pennsylvania, you could just go into the, you know, state police place where they would do the uh, driver safety test, and you'd say, "I'd like a permit for a motorcycle," and they'd say, "Okay, what's your name?" Stuff you show them your driver's license. They'd write you out a permit. It's good for six months. And there weren't any kind of laws about you know you can't. You have to be riding with somebody or whatever else. It's just you couldn't carry a passenger, which I never really did that much because, you know, just single guy and stuff. And I always like to go fast, and I didn't want some girlfriend on the back telling me, slow down, slow down, you know, so another issue. But um, so, you know, I just, I never got a driver's license, a motorcycle license. I just would always just buy these permits. Well, the law has changed over the years because it was, you know, 1990s, um, when I basically gave up bikes, late mid to late 1990s, and then it was about 
I don't even know, uh, 2003, 2004, somewhere around there when I got back into motorcycling again. So now it was a thing where if you have a permit, well, you have to have an experienced rider beside you or, you know, with you or whatever. And it was like, yeah, brother. So I thought I'm going to have to just get, you know, bite the bullet, go in, do the motorcycle test. And then they, they changed that too. You had like call and, you know, set up like six months in advance or something or a couple months in advance. It was ridiculous, which I did. But, uh, so I went, I'll show you some pictures here of this DR650 and, uh, Real nice bike. I put that Suzuki sticker above the headlight there to cover up all the scratches. But uh, I put the, um, it had the bark busters on it there with the hand grip guards. In other words, I put a rack, rear rack on it so I could haul some things around on the, on the bike. But that's basically all I did, all I did with it. Um, and uh, put, you know, just some stickers on it and fixed it up a little bit. But I get it back. I'm like, okay, you know. Let's get the thing running. So I take the carburetor apart, you know, get it all out of there and everything, and uh, take it apart, and it's just like crystal clean inside. I'm like, what in the world? And so, you know, I'm looking at the thing, and I check the plugs. I, you know, I checked a bunch of things, and I'm air cleaners just clean, perfect, and everything. And I'm just scratching my head, going like, what in the world? And I went over every kind of thing I could try to figure with this thing, and I, I saw it had this like little box thing and all these hoses and everything so I kind of looked it up and and it was like oh well, the California bikes have this smog thing the smog control deal so I was like okay well you know that thing's kind of dumb I wish that wasn't on there but I started it up and it's like island pretty rough and everything and I'm looking at things you know just trying to see do I have everything hooked up and I look at this one pipe coming out of this little rubber hose coming out of this smog thing and it's like wedged into this one spot and I'm like, you know what, that, that hose looked like it's kind of pinched a little bit. So I just reached back and pulled it out from where, I guess he had, it must have gotten knocked back in there or something. Pulled it out, it opened up, and all of a sudden the bike's just like running perfect. It's blah, 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 you know. Pull the pipe out, I'm like, you got to be kidding me. It was a pinched, you know, little smog pipe thing there, so bike ran great from then on it was a lot of fun you know driving around back roads in the area and stuff like that i did get my my motorcycle license on it and i was i was sweating it because i'd heard different you know nightmare stories you know you get the wrong kind of a guy at the motorcycle driving course thing and and they're just like you know can you do this can you do that you know and all this stuff and so i was a little bit panicked about going and i had to wait like three months to go to do this test so i go and I um, uh, do this test, and this this kind of big, heavy set, overweight guy, he comes out, and I could tell he's like kind of uh, like I don't really want to be out here because it's kind of a little bit chilly that day. It was in you know kind of late fall when I got to do my test, and uh, he comes out and he's got these two little orange cones, little rubber cones, and um, you know I'm looking at this motorcycle course thing and there's all these different lines and all this stuff and I'm like in my mind going oh boy what am I gonna have to do and he goes he sets these two cones down and he goes okay get on your bike ride down there to the end of the parking lot come up here and I want you to do three figure eights around these two cones you know drive around like this you know do three figure eights so I'm like okay so get on the bike cruise down come up around three figure eights you know Lord helped me to do them perfectly. Didn't put my feet down or anything. And I stop. I go, okay, what's next? He goes, you passed. And I'm like, huh? You know, and everybody I talked to, they're like, that's all you had to do. You know? And I guess I guess maybe he figured I'm on a dual sport. You know, I'm going to be able to do any other test, you know. But uh, I was like, that, that's it? And he's like, yeah, you're done. Picks up the cones, walks back in, fills out the thing. Here you go. Congratulations, you know, here's your motorcycle license, so, yay. <laughs> so, I had that bike for a while, and uh, really had some fun on it. It was really cool going up, you know, some of the real steep hills and real twisty, turny types of things. It really, you know, cornered good, had real good power, uh, kind of a mid-range type of power, you know. Um, not real kind of low-end, wasn't real great off-road. Just that real good strong mid range, you know, real good good for corners. 
anyway so had that thing for a little bit of time and uh started thinking to myself you know i'd like to get actually like a street bike so i decided i'd check out on ebay and i saw i was looking at different bikes and stuff at the time and this was early on in the years of my ministry 2007 2008 somewhere in there and um uh, so might even been a little bit later than that i'm not sure but uh, no, you know what? I think it was actually a little bit later. Probably about 2009, 2010 is when I had my DR650 Suzuki. So I get on eBay and I look and there's this Honda Superhawk, 1998 Honda Superhawk, VTR1000, the British call them Firestorms. And it's a V twin, kind of like a Ducati almost. It's like Honda's Ducati, enter the, to the Ducati. Not a full, like, fairinged, you know, like rocket bike, but like a you'll see pictures of it here and uh, I see the thing and it's not inspected it needed a little bit of work typical what I'd like to buy and uh, so I put a bid in on it ended up winning the bike so I'm like oh okay had sold my DR650 shortly before that and um, no I no I'm sorry I didn't I hadn't sold the DR650 yet I still had the DR650 excuse me yeah but and I won this Honda Super Hulk. So I had my dad drive me up there in his car and then, you know, I rode the bike back down uninspected and everything. <laughs> Not real bright, but you know, I mean, I was, I was riding it down. I had to transport it. You know, I, I wouldn't have gotten in trouble for it. I just told the police officer, Hey, you know, taking it down to get it inspected. They give you some leeway on that. So, um, took it down and, uh, just, went over the bike it needed some turn signals in the back it just had the integrated uh, turn signals in the tail light and uh, so I'll show you some pictures of it just absolutely beautiful machine really 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 nice bike I'll show you some pictures of the thing here it it was all stock when I bought it for the most part and I put uh, the um, uh, oh it had the little uh, uh, turn signals up front there the little flush LED turn signals and um, I put the Yoshimuro uh, slip-on exhaust on the thing and uh, this was this was money actually I would, I'd been given some inheritance money I paid 2500 bucks for the bike and uh, had a Corbin seat on it had the solo seat and um, you could take that little solo seat off on the back there and then you, know, you could put a passenger on it 13,000 miles on it uh, just you can see these different pictures here those mirrors the one time I was pushing it into the garage where I kept it and my dad was helping me and he kind of leaned a little bit funny on it and I dropped I kind of moved the bike over and it hit the one mirror and broke the one side mirror so I replaced the mirrors the stock mirrors with these aftermarket ones that actually had turn signals in the mirrors so that actually was you know just made it more visible it did have that little bit of a crack there which you know, I repaired as best I could but a lot of these pictures are you know from when I had it for sale I didn't have to jet it or anything you know change the carburetor jetting or uh, air filter or anything like that when I put the slip on exhaust on it there's the integrated tail light I put the stock turn signals back on kind of remounted them down a little bit further but uh, really really cool bike and um, and I remember uh, some of the fun stories on that thing. Um, this one time I was riding, and um, a bunch of young guys got behind me, and uh, they were, you know, pushing me a little bit, you know. And I was just trying to do the speed limit, and they were kind of coming up behind me in a sport utility vehicle, and it was ticking me off because, you know, they it's you don't tailgate a motorcycle, okay? Anything could run out in front of me, and I'm hitting my brakes, and and they're just going to plow me over, so. So I just, I came through this corner, got down, came through the corner, and then just took off, and I was in second, and I, and I you know, and, and the thing was just torque monster, and, and I, as I shifted into third, I kind of snapped it, and just as I was snapping it, and it kind of dropped down a little bit, so where I snapped it, it was right at that little bit of a hill, and the thing just went, Whoa, and just did this huge wheelie, and I wasn't ready for it, you know, and, and just scared me half to death, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to do it. I was just trying to get away from these two knuckleheads. So I, I, you know, did this huge wheelie, 
brought it back down and, and took off. And I thought they're probably thinking like I'm some professional racer or something like this. It's like, <laughs> no, that's kind of a mistake. But fun bike. But I noticed that uh, the main reason I got rid of it was because it was just, you know, it was leading to a lot of pride because it was a lot fast bike and everything else. And I'm saved now. I'm in ministry. Uh, you know, I mean, this was a, a bike. didn't cost me that much money. Um, just kind of a cheap thrill thing. And like I said, it was uh, just some inheritance money that I'd gotten. And I thought, oh, I'm just going to get something. I'm a single guy, you know, whatever. And uh, so I, I had the bike for a little while. Ended up selling it because I just thought, you know, I can't... You know, there were times I'd take it out, I'd ride, and I'd be trying to pray and, you know, and stuff to talk to the Lord about different things. And, and it was just like this constant... Because uh, I, I had a big thing back when I had my ZX-11. I would like to hunt down guys with Harleys, Harley-Davidson motorcycles, because they're slow and everything. You know, and I'd try to humiliate them with my, my Ninja. <laughs> you know, try to go real fast and just blow past them and stuff. And, you know, I found myself being tempted to do that again. Because I just had an attitude against these tough guys, you know, and stuff. But whatever. And I'm just like, you know what? I, I can't have this bike. I can't have this rocket bike. So decided to get rid of it and as kind of like a I'll you know amend my ways here and and I'll go to the exact opposite of a super hawk I'll go from really ripping fast bike to uh this bike <laughs> a uh I'll stand over this way so you can be seeing the pictures and things um Yamaha TW200 and uh 1990 Yamaha TW200 uh, again eBay find I found the thing I paid, I think, just under $1,000 for it, and it had been sitting for many years. Uh, it had been wrecked. Um, you can see the uh, clutch right there. The clutch lever up top is broken off. Um, there's a better picture of that. The front brake there, lever was all bent up, twisted up the, the uh, throttle there, the grip. It was all chewed up at the end where it had been wrecked pretty bad. Ta gas tank was dented in from the guy's knee <laughs> that had wrecked it. You know, it's a good deal there. The, the rear turn signal was all duct taped on. The left one was, the mount was kind of bent. You know, 2,719 miles on it when I bought it. And um, so I basically fixed it all up, kind of restored it back to the way it was. I, couldn't do all the work myself because it was pretty bad and I took it to a local motorcycle repair guy and uh, he you know went over it and stuff what I couldn't do he did and because he he had some you know some of his tools and some of the things like he had this one of these tanks that you put a carburetor into and it's like this I forget how the thing works like a sign of vibration or something like a high vibration and it'll knock all the dirt off of it and he did that on the bike and I put a, a plastic tank on there, a high capacity ga uh, gas tank, and that thing could go 250 miles on one tank of gas. It got about 80 miles per gallon, so that part was really cool, and um, <clears throat> not a very fast bike. I put a smaller sprocket, smaller teeth on the back, so it increased the highway speed a little bit without sacrificing too much of the power of it. It's only a 200cc, so <laughs> not very powerful. But it was a blast on back dirt roads and stuff like that. I had a lot of fun on it. But uh, it was downright scary riding that thing. There's a picture of it with a little luggage box on the back. I could cruise around on that, do little errands and things on that bike. And so, um, so I was, you know, doing little side jobs, some logging type of stuff at that point in time, firewood sales and whatever else, saving up a little bit of money just for whatever things and and uh and so um again you know buying and selling motorcycles buying a bike fixing it selling it making a little bit of a profit on the side is what i was doing and um so again on ebay and i look and uh there was a, a dealership actually down in the town where my sister and her husband live in west virginia and they had a bunch of older klr 650s at the time, it would have been, I think, 2011. I think it was, yeah, 2011 uh, at that point in time. And I always, there was, there's been a couple bikes that were always kind of on my mental 
list of I'd love to have one someday. And uh, dual sports were always one of my favorites because it's half dirt, half street, you know. So I always wanted a TW200. I had one, and it was a fun little bike, great fun. Um, still wish I actually had the thing. It was it was a really neat little bike, very, very good on gas. But um, it just wasn't strong enough on the on the highway. I mean, 60, 65 miles an hour. You know, it's, that was about it. And, um, you know, I had a guy actually tailgating me on that thing, and there was nothing I could do about it. I couldn't get away from him. So it wasn't much fun. But uh, so I was on eBay, and I saw they had these leftover 2009 Kawasaki KLR 650s. And I've talked about this bike in other studies, you know, and, and uh, but I've I bought the thing. Um, put a bit in on it. I won the bike, and um, brand new. It was a factory leftover, you know, two-year-old motorcycle, but you know, brand new down at their dealership there. And uh, so paid for the whole thing and everything else. And then we went down to see my sister and her husband, and I brought the bike back in the back of my pickup truck. And um, so this is before I got married. So here's some pictures of it. Right after I brought it home stock bike it was my first brand new motorcycle never had one before that and uh just totally stock at that point in time there's my truck in the background there you can see with the bumper magnets on the back and um and then there it is i uh over the next you know couple of months or whatever else i you know again some of the money that i had i mean you know we're not dealing with a lot of money here okay so, uh, just in case people out there, I know my enemies try to attack me on things. So, um, but just little bits here and there I'd put into the bike. I put a new seat on it. I put new uh, LED tail light in the back that would flash rather than just come on and be on like that. I put the the hard uh, panniers on the back there, the big luggage things on the side. I put a, a GV luggage thing on the back. I put crash bars up front I mean I, I really had the thing decked out put a new windshield that was a lot higher um, for better you know I wasn't getting hit by the wind the stock windshield was not very high on them things so I put a lot of different things into it put a GPS mount on it and stuff I could run GPS on the thing and just absolutely loved the bike it was it was a really really wonderful machine and uh, and you know just it, it was kind of neat because it was like Kind of the best of both worlds you know the klrs are very you know they're bigger they're the biggest of the 650s you know at least in the past you know and um but it was a good combination of you know it could go somewhat off-road but not real great off-road but it was very capable on the road it was it was i'd take it on long rides and stuff like that it was it was good real comfortable um just a real good bike really loved the bike uh, enough speed that I get away from people that were being jerks to me or whatever else, but not so much speed that it went to my head and made me do stupid things. And I was on that bike the one day I was riding along, and I was just praying. And I was just saying, Lord, I just, you know, all these years I've been single. I was 36 years old at the time. And uh, I said, all these years I've been single, Lord, I just, I really would love to get married. And, and you know, at that time, the Lord uh, spoke to me. And again, you watch my videos on what it means when the Lord speaks to you. And um, but the Lord told me that I was going to have a wife on, you know, the back of that bike within a year, and it came to pass. Um, uh, within a year, my wife Catherine, uh, I was taking her for rides on that bike. So really neat. But uh, I remember the actually the very first time I took my wife for a ride, went out to Iowa and got her and brought her back and had the KLR 650 and I'm telling her, you know, you know, she's never owned a motorcycle before. And so I'm like, oh, it's safe. You know, I've been riding since I was 10 years old. You, you'll love it. It's going to be great and everything else. We get on the bike and I couldn't go out the stone lane of the, of the place where we were at at the time. I had to go down through the woods. There was a back trail that went down through the woods and it was kind of muddy that day. And I'm like, ah, you'll be fine. We'll be fine. You know, let's go down through. And the tires on the KLRs aren't the best for off-road, but I thought that'd be okay. So we go down. I mean, we're like 50 feet down the trail, and I hit some mud and just totally laid the bike over. You know, just bam. We weren't going fast or anything, but just 
boom and, you know we both go flipping off the bike and stuff and like so much for the ah oh, everything's great you know kind of trying to be a little bit prideful you know to my new wife here and, and uh you know i'm this great rider and everything else and so but she laughed about it and we still laugh about it today and uh another time we were living up in and this you know early on in our marriage we had two vehicles we had my pickup truck um and we had the klr 650 so again it wasn't like oh cool we got this cool bike and it's whatever else we had two vehicles you know if the truck broke down which it did sometimes we would ride the motorcycle and uh, the one time we actually um, were moving from we had moved up to north western pennsylvania and we were moving our stuff we'd been there for a while that whole debacle working with the baptist church up there left there put the klr 650 in a moving truck packed a bunch of our stuff in moved down and then uh lo unloaded everything and then rode the klr 650 five hours back up that night and uh by the time we got back up there it was like in the 30s out you know fahrenheit and it was you know just bone chilling cold and we're just you know just, just riding that thing and uh we made it but man that was a cold cold ride and uh, i've ridden in all kinds of you know weather and everything else year round um so and there's actually our my 94 ford ranger that i had that thing for a long time actually actually went out to um that's what we drove here to maine that was you can see the bottom of my wife's legs there with her skirt on there out you know on the passenger side of the truck we we're getting stuff out one of the places we stayed when we came here to maine to visit and uh, had that truck for a while, and then we sold it when we were here. Uh, real good truck. But uh, the KLR 650 uh, was the last bike I had down in Pennsylvania, and we just realized, you know, we're not going to be able to, to make it, you know, bring it up here and stuff. We need the extra money, so I ended up selling it. And, uh, it was, uh, I mean, I never, I mean, it was really... Yeah, you always feel kind of weird. You sell a vehicle, and it's like you see the guy taking it away or riding it away or whatever else, and it's like, ah, oh, you know. And uh, But that KLR 650 was really hard for me to see that thing go because I'd put a lot of work into that bike and had a lot of really good times on that motorcycle. So tough, but the Lord blessed us since then. So we were up here. Um, when we first moved here, uh, we had our truck, and we had actually bought this three-wheeler, it was a around the same time because we were using it to do firewood and things and uh and we had actually bought this it was a an actual honda big red 1985 250 big red and uh i taught my wife how to ride on that thing and there it is and uh, i did a video years ago um, where when we had brought it here we had it sitting outside under a tarp and then i'd moved it back to our property in littleton and it was back there with the tarp and uh i'll actually show you some video here i'll, I'll put some video in i'll just do it this way right now you know what i'm just going to play the video I'll be back in a minute here she goes across the one lane bridge Doing great. <laughs> Taking her time, that's good. That bridge is way up there. I won't be able to film going across. We'll do it when we come back. Okay, so there's the video. My wife riding across this bridge on the ATV trail, which is right up behind our place up here. It goes down. A lot of ATV trails up here. But uh, that thing, the stupid ethanol gas, the, it ate away the, the rubber gasket and the carburetor. And actually, the carburetor leaked the one time. And I had my son in a little baby carrier on my chest and my wife sitting on the back of the three-wheeler 
And we get up there, and, and then all of a sudden, this tree will just like burst into flames. I jump off. Thankfully, my son wasn't hurt at all. And we tried to put the fire out, and it just, the whole three order was a loss. So, very sad. It was a really good condition, old Honda, big red, all original and everything. It was just, it was really nice. I mean, it, some scratches and cracks and whatever, but it was, ran really, really good. Loved that thing. So that was a bit hard. But uh, we we're up here, and we had, again, we're back to the situation with just our, our Ford truck. And so it was like, okay, we really should have a secondary vehicle. And um, so I thought, well, what are we going to do? At the time, we didn't have our son Oliver. So I said, well, let's get another motorcycle because I know how to work on bikes. I can fix motorcycles and everything else. So another one that was on my list was an XR650. I like, you know, the bigger dual sports. I had a DR650 then a KLR650, Suzuki, Kawasaki. I thought it'd be neat to get a Honda. Found one in Southern Maine. It was in real good shape. Got a real good deal on it uh, from a private individual. It was a guy that had gotten cancer or something, I think, and he couldn't ride anymore, so he had to sell it. And uh, so <clears throat> put a little bit into it, put a luggage box on the back and that rear rack there. You can see the bike here. Um, I had that thing, and that was our secondary um, machine there. And... Uh, 2,500 miles on it. These are a lot of the pictures I took for, you know, selling it. And uh, so we had that bike, and I kept that thing until I found out that, you know, my wife was with child. And so I said, well, there's no point if I'm gonna if we're gonna be a family now we're gonna have a little baby. Well, then you know there's no point really in us keeping this bike, um, you know, because you know I pretty much we go everywhere together and stuff. So. But uh, before I got rid of it, um, this XR650 actually shares a very, or has a very unique distinction from all other machines. Um, I actually baptized that bike, you know, by full immersion the one time. Uh, when we were going back to our property, our idiot neighbor that we used to have, he would, you know, plow the lane in. He, would, he just would, you know, plow all this dirt right onto our right away going back. And there's no way to get back in there. We couldn't drive our truck back in because it's blocked off. So I had the XR650. We had to go back to the property the one time. And um, so we're riding this thing. And I'm like, okay, well, we're just going to have to go down the bank through the, the uh, there's a brook there, you know, pretty good sized. And we could, you know, I wouldn't call it a river necessarily, but it was, you know, decent amount of water. If you've seen some of the older videos and I'm standing there, you know, and, and I'm like standing and you can see all the water behind me. Well, that's where it was, just kind of a narrower part of that where it came through the culverts. And so I'm like, oh, you know, not a problem. We'll t I'll just kind of ride down through there, and then we'll go up, you know, to our property. So we did, rode up, we're riding around and stuff like that, did what we needed to do back at the property. Um, we had to take a few things over and turn around, come back down. I had my wife, actually, it was the, it was the time I, we had the three-wheeler. That's right. She rode through the, the creek on the three-wheeler. I rode through on the XR650, put the three-wheeler up there, put a tarp on it, riding back down through with the XR650, and I went down through this spot, it kind of dropped in, kind of weird, and, you know, I got her on the back, she's with child, you know, Oliver's in her belly there and, and stuff, and I go down in there, and I just totally laid the bike over, I mean, hit a rock, and then just kind of, whoop, and poof, down in, it wasn't going fast, but just, you know, and that thing just totally under the water. You know, and both of us along with it, you know, and uh, it wasn't, you know, real deep or anything, but we, I got up, got the bike up out of there and stuff, pulled it up out, you know, <laughs> and then it wouldn't start, you know, and stuff. So I finally got the thing, you know, the, I pushed it out to where my neighbor's place was and thankfully he was there and not too drunk at the time and he had a battery charger. So, you know, we charged the battery and stuff and I got the bike started again, but then we're riding home and it was early spring here it was pretty cold so we're riding along you know I'm just cold again so my wife had been through a lot uh, with me and some of our uh, our adventures that we go on but um, so we sold that and you know because I thought well, there's not really any point in having a street bike um, because you know I'd like to take her and Oliver along with us after Oliver was born and uh, 
but we still needed a way to get back to our property. So we started looking into the thing of, okay, we lost our Honda Big Red. That was one of the ways we could get back through. And um, so I thought, well, okay, we'll start looking for a used four-wheeler, something that's not too expensive. And I thought, you know, I'll get something for my wife because by that time she had ridden, uh, she never rode anything with a clutch or whatever else, but she was very good at riding four-wheelers and ATVs and whatever. So I thought, I'm going to look for something that she can ride, but it needs to be powerful enough that it can pull a trailer, a little utility trailer and stuff like that, so we can haul things back to our property because so we're trying to build back in there. And um, <clears throat> so I said something to her about, you know, do you want some kind of utility ATV or whatever else? Well, no, 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 and stuff. And so I was like, well, I'd like to get you a bigger bore type of a thing because she has enough sense. You know, she's actually, she learned how to ride pretty quickly. And so um, looked about a KFX, Kawasaki KFX 700. That might seem like a lot of overkill, but my wife is actually a pretty good rider. And I'll show you a picture here, actually. One, um, there's the one we found on Craigslist. It was down in New Hampshire. A motorcycle shop had it down there. It had been traded in. An older man had it. And uh, he was pulling a trailer with it, and uh, and he actually his grandson wrecked it really bad. You can see the plastics are mangled up there, and you can see the rear grab bar is bent completely up. The front bumper was just totally smashed, and and it had a couple other issues with it when we first bought it. And so my wife did most of the modifications herself out there in her dress, you know, and stuff, or kind of a work dress that she had. She's out there sitting in the yard, you know, putting parts on it. She changed the oil and everything. I taught her how to do that. And uh, putting the plastics back on. The one time I remember she's like putting the, you know, tightening the bolts. And she's like really yanking on this one bolt. I'm like, ah, it snap, snap the head of the bolt off. <laughs> but, you know, she's just a, she's a good wife. And, and uh, you know, I fixed it and everything else. Had to drill the bolt out and everything, you know. So, but, uh it's a pretty big bolt too that she snapped off. It was kind of funny, but uh, so we put, you know, some money into the thing. Um, didn't pay a whole lot for it because it was wrecked, you know, and and uh, but we put, you know, fixed it up and stuff enough that because you know the cracked fenders and things, you'd ride it on the trails and it's just like you're getting sprayed with mud on the left side. So we used that thing quite a bit because we could actually ride to our property on the ATV trails back here. So there were a lot of times we were not even driving our vehicles. You know, if we had to go back and work at our property, driving a vehicle over, you'd got to park, and then you got to carry everything back in. At least with our four-wheelers, we were able to ride over on the ATV trail, then go right back through and go down through the creek or out around the big piles of dirt that the stupid neighbor had there in the way. But uh, <clears throat> that's what the four-wheeler looks like right now. It's actually for sale. Uh, 2005 KFX 700. Um, we put new plastics on it and stuff like that just simply because, like I said, you'd get sprayed with dirt if you didn't. And uh, put Nerf bars on it simply because, uh, again, we're not trying to make it look ultra awesome or anything, but we just put Nerf bars on because we would ride, the three of us rode on that thing quite a bit to and from the property. So it was actually more like a vehicle, and you can ride on the roads up here. Most of them, the police won't say anything. There's a lot of ATV access roads. Just show you a couple of pictures of the thing. Um, we used it for a while, and now, uh, now it's you know our new property. We don't need it, so we're going to be selling the thing. And again, you know, uh, I've been doing this off and on over the years. You know, buying and fixing up motorcycles and ATVs, and then you sell them for a little bit of profit. So, uh, just been kind of a little sideline way to make money, and. Um, <clears throat> so that's what we're going to be doing with that thing. Uh, tried to sell it right before winter time. Didn't get anybody at all interested. So uh, probably this coming spring, when things warm up a little bit, we're going to sell it and uh, make a little bit of money there. That'll help with you know ministry expenses and stuff like that. Or you know maybe buy some other thing like that to fix it and sell it. But I mean, it's, you're not you know I'm not getting rich from it or anything else. But uh, good four-wheeler I remember the one little funny experience on that thing um, my wife is real good riding it and stuff like that she's never you know she doesn't do any kind of stupid riding on it or anything 
but we're cruising along the one time and she's driving and I had Oliver holding, you know, I had him on the little baby carrier thing, you know, strapped to my chest and she's up front and, uh, you know, because normally she would have him on her, she'd be sitting on the back, but I was like, hey, you ride home, you drive it home this time, I trust you, you know, I'll ride on the back, so I'm sitting there like this. And we're cruising along this one spot and it was like really bad with mosquitoes and these big horse flies. And this horse fly lands on her forehead and just, you know, just, I don't know if they sting or bite or whatever they do, but the thing just nailed her right here on the forehead and she went, ah, like that. And and when she moved her hand, she hit the throttle and we like, whoa, did this <laughs> big old wheelie. And she brought the thing back down again, you know, thankfully, but, but uh, that was the only time she lost control of the thing and it didn't resolve in an accident so again you know people don't they don't think that about my wife they probably think you know uh she's just weird or whatever else no she's actually um pretty good at riding atv as well we used you know we've gone like i said we put a lot of miles on that thing go back and forth to the property and now we don't need it so we're gonna sell it and she'd actually like to get rid of the four-wheeler and get a four-legger eventually a horse so um that's another thing, another issue. But you know, the whole time she rode that thing, she never once wore pants. So those of you women out there that think, oh, you gotta wear uh, you know, pants on occasion or whatever, well, not necessarily. My wife uh, was able to ride that thing quite a few times with a dress on, so, and did a good job on it. So anyways, that's that thing.